Good evening. This is Ota King Seminar. Oops, I started talking too early. I was supposed to start when the camera zoomed. That was my mistake. Today is September 8th. The typhoon outside is becoming stronger and stronger. For today, I'll finish talking about Panyo that I started last month. So, I guess this will complete the lecture series about Panyo. First, I'll chit chat a little since I haven't done it recently. I was thinking what I could talk about. Since the typhoon has been approaching this week, I've been so lazy <laughs> due to the air pressure and all. But I have to start moving to a new office since the current one is becoming packed. I'll move the office, but the studio will remain where it is now. I'll keep everything here as it is. Well, I might move some of my plastic models to the new office. So around October, I may drastically change the arrangement of the bookshelves. As I already said, I haven't done chit chats recently. And next week, I will review books. So in about two weeks, I will dedicate an entire lecture to chit chatting. So you can send questions or send letters of encouragement. I'll happily accept them until around the week after next. By the way, the number of YouTube subscribers is almost at 100,000. At this rate, thinking optimistically, it will go over 100,000 by next Sunday, September 15th. 100,000 is really not a big number in the YouTube industry. My channel is just moving up from small scale to moderate scale. Celebrity YouTubers would set a goal for 1 million subscribers. That's too far away from me. Someone just commented, Oh, I haven't subscribed! Oh, come on, please! The benefit of having a good number of subscribers is, well, it's a rumor, but Google will treat you more humanely. I'd very much like to be treated as a human. I'll make sure to put the silver shield here, if YouTube sends me one. As I said, 100,000 subscribers is nothing in the YouTuber industry, which I'm sure everyone is already well aware of. But it was also my personal goal to reach up to 100,000. And it took me half a year to prepare and get to this point. So I feel accomplished, which is something I kind of lacked recently. It's like how I can feel that I successfully lost weight by looking at the actual number. You know how that feels good. If the number goes over 100,000, I will issue some funny stickers to commemorate. Thank you very much. Okay, let's start from this week's Natsuzora. So this week's Natsuzora. First look at the picture on the upper half. There was a conversation between Tenyo who died and Natsu. It's a bit dim and hard to tell. This is a painting by Tenyo right here. It's a scene where Natsu speaks to Tenyo's self-portrait. Then, unnoticeably, Tenyo himself appears. So it looks as if Natsu speaks to Tenyo directly. It may look supernatural, but it's more sentimental, where Natsu finds out what's in her own mind through a conversation with Tenyo, and Tenyo encourages Natsu. It's a good scene. Why I say it's a good scene is not because of the plot where Tenyo's painting turns into himself. There's more to this painting. The secret is that this was originally a portrait of Natsu, which you could see in an episode around June. Tenyo painted a portrait of a girl he liked, but that girl left for Tokyo. Then he got a letter from the girl that said she needed to focus on work, so she couldn't come back. Or more precisely, she wouldn't come back. Natsu spoke her mind clearly to Tenyo. Tenyo saw that letter and painted over the girl's portrait. He erased the entire image. Then on top of that, he painted himself. So, this scene may look like Natsu is speaking to Tenyo, but actually she's talking to herself, which is hidden beneath Tenyo. When I saw this episode in June where Tenyo painted over Natsu's portrait, I knew that the script writer was trying to foreshadow something and it was explained here. 
I didn't get emotional or anything. I was rather going, oh, that earlier scene connects to this scene. I see. What moved me was the next scene. Where you see the package design of a snack shop called Setsugetsu, meaning snow and moon. It's a shop in Tokachi, Hokkaido. Tenyo painted this illustration on the wrapping paper, which I thought was super cool. It's cool, but it's also weird. The shop is called Setsugetsu, snow and moon. But do you see any snow or moon in this picture? No! Coming up with a design like that during the 70s in Japan would be too avant-garde. I would say it's very unlikely, but in the picture, you see a girl standing in the middle of Mother Nature, and the farm fence crosses the field toward the front, and the mountains are in the back. I thought this landscape was pretty cool. It moved me. Anyway, so ladies and gentlemen, the uh, production of Heidi, Girl of the Alps, has now begun. Now, I have made the prediction about this drama series before, that in the climax episode, all the animation staff would go on location scouting. Just like how the staff of Heidi really went on location scouting, I was right. Next week's preview shows this. Iku is hidden behind the daughter because he's tripped, but I think the entire crew is here. Through location scouting, it's important to show the art director what the world of the anime should look like. Since the art director is Tenyo's brother, it may be unnecessary, but he's there regardless. Again, this sequence has been inspired by the actual location scouting for Heidi. In this picture, you see young Hayao Miyazaki, Mr. Kotabe, and Isao Takahata. Heidi, Girl of the Alps, began in 1974. It was January 1974. This was 1973. I can't tell you how much this revolutionized animation making. People used to call anime TV manga during this time. I'll spend a good amount of time one day to talk about how things changed. But one complaint I have is, if they were to imitate Heidi, Girl of the Alps, they should have titled it Sora, Girl of Tokachi. Anyway, I'm expecting the last episode to be a mixture of the opening scene and Sora's anime, where the actual drama characters are videotaped, and added to the anime through the technique called rotoscope and put together with the anime characters. It's not going to be a combination of the live action scenes and anime like in Mary Poppins. I think they will rather overlap the opening anime and the anime Sora makes in the drama. At least that's what I think. This week, the project proposal was finally submitted. It says Overview, TV Manga, title is TBD. Little House on the Prairie or Laura the Prairie Girl for the title of the anime. But no way that's misleading. Natsu Okuhara as the animation director, Ikyu Sakata as the director. Now pay attention to the starting date of the broadcast. October 1974. Total 39 episodes. Now I have to say that this is a bit strange. I mean, in reality, the broadcasting of Heidi, Girl of the Alps, began on January 6, 1974. So, why October? There's no point in writing it down. There's no need to write summer of 1874 or fall, so why write October here? It's because of Space Battleship Yamato. Space Battleship Yamato and Heidi were on different channels. So Heidi, as you can see on the chart here, was broadcasted from January of 1974 for one year, while Yamato began in October of 1974. Heidi and Yamato were known to be in rivalry, or a rumor says that the mega hit of Heidi led to the discontinuation of Yamato, but in fact, the periods on air overlapped only by three months. Yamato didn't 
end Heidi halfway through the broadcast because Heidi had already ended before that. Now it says in here, Sora, Girl of Hokkaido. It's a title I came up with. There's a scene where Natsu looks up at the sky and says, Let's go, Sora! Sora means sky in Japanese. It sounds awkward, though. This is a hint given by the writer. I think the screenplay writer isn't really good at foreshadowing. Anyway, now I'm thinking that the title of the anime will be Sora. I think the reason why the two animes begin at the same time in the drama is because the story wants to depict how Sora almost loses in the popularity battle against Yamato, and the broadcast almost stops in the middle of the season. That's probably the climax of the drama. Well, I'm just imagining this. But then, I'm pretty confident that something similar will happen at the climax. Then finally, this person will appear. Actress Non will probably appear in this role. In the last lecture, I guessed that Non would appear as an evil producer of space battleship Musashi. But I also doubt that NHK has enough guts to risk upsetting Non's previous production company by giving her such a big exposure, knowing the two had a conflict. SMAP goes with how NHK treats SMAP, the idol group, so the possibility is that Non just reads a line of an anime character like, we're back at the mountain, yay, and we'll just see her back. That won't upset the production company. Still, NHK will have given a role to all previous morning soap opera actors in Natsuzora, which is the hundredth story of the program. My true hope is to see Non as the evil producer of Space Battleship Musashi, who almost ends the broadcast of Sora, but the more realistic hope is that she will cameo as a voice actor. Then, the question is whether or not Sora will discontinue in the middle of the season and how Natsu will meet her younger sister again. You know Natsu's sister is called Chiharu. I think the actress who plays the role is either 16 or 17. But by the time Heidi Girl of the Alps is on air, Natsu was already... Is it here? She's 37! Which means the younger sister has to be 34 then. It's impossible for an actress that young to act as a 34 year old. So what are they going to do? The only solution I can think of would be that the younger sister already died and the actress comes out as her daughter. To tell Natsu her last words. If Natsu's niece looked exactly like her mother, then considering that Natsu's sister gave birth when she was 19, the daughter can be 14 years old now. So, today, I came up with my prediction on where the actress who played Chiharu would appear in the drama. She will come out as Chiharu's orphan. She's the successor of the dairy product brand, Kalpis. She will say her signature line, I want to continue watching Sora, when it's beaten by Musashi's explosive popularity and almost terminated before the end. Then help arrives. Chiharu hides her history of marrying the son of the manager of Kalpis, who will sponsor Sora. She died after giving birth to her daughter. The daughter, who perfectly resembles her mother, says, I want to continue watching Sora. I won't let it end. Is there anything I can do for you? So Kalpis funds the project by sponsoring and creating a TV program called Kalpis Manga Theater. Later, Chiharu's daughter and Kalpis, well, I'm pretty sure they'll change the company to something fictional, but they will make an anime studio in Tokachi. A studio where Natsu and her colleagues can make ideal anime at. I'm guessing the name of the studio will be Suroko, which means hot air in Italian. Chiharu will build a studio called Shiroko, the hot air. And later, they will make a feature anime film titled Spirited Away, Natsu and Chiharu, and win the Oscar. How does that sound? I heard the shooting of Natsu Zora has already ended, but they can still add some narration, right? How about my version as the ending? Oh well, that was my prediction. I'll talk about something else next week. All right. It's getting a little chilly. Can you please turn off the fan? Sorry.
Now, a commenter said, how about producer Suzuki? Oh, that's right. Can any actor look that evil? How about Suzuki himself? That was mean. <laughs> well, that's possible. But anyway, moving on. Here. Ponyo. And here comes our mascot. Nekoron. Horror. The psychic spots in Ponyo, which even local citizens fear. Meow. We've got a letter from a salon member, Ikejiri Mitsuo. Thank you, Nekoron. Hi, I live in Fukuyama City, Hiroshima, where Ponyo is set in. In the last lecture, you mentioned how the huge boobs of Grandmama approach a ship. The ship crew shouts, the goddess! I wonder why the crew calls Grandmama the Buddhist goddess. But it eventually made sense to me after you explained the boobs drew near the ship. Behind the mound, there is a Buddhist goddess we all know well. It's a statue on top of a cliff called Abuto Kanon, who is worshipped as a deity of navigation and easy delivery. Mothers who breastfeed are said to be blessed. Inside the hall, you see so many votive tables with handmade breasts attached. That's how the crew saying, the goddess, made sense to me. They're associating the huge boobs with the goddess Abuto Kanon. By the way, the goddess of breasts exists, not only in Hiroshima, but Okayama and other prefectures around Seto Inland Sea. Ikejiri-san continues, Among other locations that come out in the movie, I know another haunted spot. Panyo and Sosuke go to a place called Fukuyama Green Line, a resort area where a child was killed and his corpse abandoned. The place is quite famous among the locals. The latter half of the movie has so many haunted places that only the locals know of. For example, the hotel resort on top of a mountain people are headed to after the tsunami is based on a real place. And he's listed the names of those hotels. But if you Google them, you'll find out they're all haunted spots. While the movie is already surreal, it's scary to see people in the town all head for hotels that are haunted spots. The sign of the hotel that crosses the screen looks almost like an ill omen to me. Now, I checked the scene to confirm. And yeah, you see Sosuke and Ponyo on a small boat in the back. But this sign, the name of the hotel passes the screen fast, quite unnatural. It also seems meaningful. This hotel has been closed for 20 years when Miyazaki visited it for location scouting. Ikejiri-san asks, why do people head for this hotel? It's a sign given by Miyazaki who wanted to leave a space for interpretation to the audience. Maybe there is afterlife past this point. Meanwhile, some people in the town are celebrating a good take of fish. Miyazaki wanted to avoid the audience easily associating images with themes like death, such as in Spirited Away. That's why he intentionally showed both good and bad omens simultaneously, which was confusing, but it also made Miyazaki feel more relieved to express his subconsciousness in a more straightforward manner. Now, let me finish the letter. Lisa's car stops in the middle of a mountain road. Why does that happen? Not only Lisa's car, but after encountering the boobs, the ship engine also stops. By the way, the most famous supernatural phenomenon at Fukuyama Green Line is that car engines stop working. Any relations? My last question is about the tunnel near Green Line. Why did Panyo say, I don't like this place at the tunnel? The tunnel in the movie looks like Muruhama Tunnel or Abuto Tunnel. When a child was killed, the body was left near a tunnel and it became another famous haunted spot. This is too scary for me, but yes, this is the scene and sure, the camera pans down and you see Panyo and Sosuke holding hands and trying to enter the tunnel. Then, you clearly see a sign on the road that says, stop. I mean, the whole scene is intentionally depicted to look spooky. Now, this whole scene where two people hold hands and enter a place that says stop, reminds me of... 
This scene in Ultra Q, an episode called The Devil's Child. This is the package illustration of the laser disc. Tunnels and railroads often symbolize a path to the afterlife. Railroads came out in Spirited Away, so a tunnel was the other choice. Two people holding hands originated from a photo taken by Diane Arbus, a photographer who documented American poverty from around the end of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century. And there's a photo of twin girls that turned out extremely scary. That image later inspired Stanley Kubrick to make a similar scene in The Shining, where twin girls hold hands in a hallway. We don't know why the scene gives us a chill. But whatever that is, it definitely derives from Diane Arbus's photo of those twin girls. This illustration is also strongly inspired by Arbus. Back to the scene where Ponyo and Sosuke in front of the tunnel. It's spooky, but it's also meaningful because Sosuke is escorting Ponyo who refuses to proceed. It means Sosuke is being tested here. Because Sosuke will be destined to force Ponyo to do what she refuses for the rest of his life as a husband's duty. It's like closing the Pandora's box that Ponyo opened and saving the world from the flood. This scene is depicted to give a mythical atmosphere, but still, it is spooky. Ikejiri-san also pointed out that the town shown at the ending is drawn differently. The ending scene shows the town one last time. Let me first show you the image of the town in the movie. In this image, you see the ocean on the left side, while Sosuke's house is on the right. And the shipbuilding yard is far in the back. But at the ending, these positions are reversed. Let me show you the image for the ending. It's kind of hard to see, but... So... This is how it looks. The camera pans from the left, showing the lighthouse. You see the town, and you see a nursing home built together with a nursery, and Sosuke's house on the right. Therefore, Sosuke's house has swapped locations with the shipbuilding yard and the nursery in the ending. But why? Ikechiri-san says, however, the locations of the shipbuilding yard and nursery didn't move. Sure, it's a contradiction. I'll get to this at the end of the lecture. This is clearly a message from Miyazaki. Flipping the location of the town in the ending is like the biggest trick of this movie by Miyazaki. That's all I can say for now, but during the lecture today, I'll definitely discuss this in depth. The ending of Ponyo is quite interesting because it's what Miyazaki accomplished after rejecting all of his own previous methods. On top of this picture, you'll also see the end credits, which is also scandalous. I'll talk about it at the after-school talk of the premium broadcast. Now, it's already 25 minutes. It was a lot easier when I took a break in the middle of the lecture, so... I'll take a three-minute break now. Anyone wants to use the restroom? I'm not going to the second part yet. We'll restart at around 2028. 20, Meanwhile, I'll take a break. Okay. Yeah, use the restroom. Oh yeah, I have some coffee. Have some coffee. And relax. Yeah, I see your comments, I'll read them. Muska wouldn't wait the whole three minutes. <laughs> I like that. Make some plastic models? I know, I have a whole stack. But I'm so silly, I bought a crazy amount of Lego. <laughs> so this month, I'll make Lego. I also have to make the diorama of the bathhouse of Spirited Away, which is going to be tougher. 
How about Blade Runner at IMAX? Uh, sure, I do want to watch it at Ikebukuro, which has a huge IMAX theater. I heard it's very nice. That reminds me, I heard watching Horus on 4K is so good. I saw what anime critic Hikawa wrote on Facebook. I thought, oh yeah? So I'm a bit tempted. What Lego did I buy? Mm, I like building towns on Lego. I bought the toughest looking ones. I collect the Lego City series, but it's been about three years since I bought the last one of the series, so I bought a lot this time to catch up. And, um, I bought the oldest edition of Millennium Falcon. I got the box today, and it came in the size of an elementary school desk. I felt dizzy looking at it, but I'll do my best. Oh, I have one more minute. Here you go. Why don't you make Giorama out of Lego? I know, that's going to be satisfying, making it out of Lego. I don't think I'm talented or skilled enough to build my own Lego, though. <laughs> sure, I want to try, but to actually try, you need the ability or talent, which I don't have. Depressing, but oh well. Okay. It's 28 minutes, let's start again. Coffee goes here. So... There's an official documentary of Ponyo that Ghibli has released. It comes in two discs. Oh, it's glaring. How about this? The first disc of the two is 5 hours 47 minutes long, and the second 6 hours and 45 minutes. That would total more than 12 hours, which makes it so hard to watch the whole thing. I managed to watch the whole thing, but actually, I enjoyed it. For example, the first image of Ponyo has a different title. It was called Ia Ia and on the Cliff, not Ponyo. Next to the title, you see the image of Fujimoto. Miyazaki had a solid image of him from the early stage. Sosuke is there too, but it's a quick sketch while Fujimoto is drawn bigger and more specifically. Ponyo was a frog at this point, not a fish. Which means... It's similar to the frog prince, but with the genders of the main character switch. So, you can tell that in Ponyo, a boy kisses a frog queen and the queen turns into a human. The documentary tells you something important like that, but since it's 10 hours long, it also confuses you with enormous amounts of information. Today, I'll go over the outline of this incredibly long documentary to give you an idea. Let's begin from the first part, which is already confusing. Animation director Kondo has a daughter called Fuki. The production of Ponyo speeds up when Miyazaki decides to use Fuki as the model for Ponyo. This is Fuki. Miyazaki screams, she's exactly Ponyo! She has a strong personality which is unchildlike. Fuki's already one year old, old enough to grab the feeding bottle by herself. However, she refuses to drink from the bottle unless her parents hold it for her. She's a strong girl who doesn't hesitate to grab the toy she likes, but when it comes to milk, she makes her inferiors. Her parents hold the bottle for her while she drinks from it sluggishly, super selfish. Miyazaki sees her upturned eyes and thinks, this is it! He's instantly inspired. Then it was funny how Miyazaki starts drawing the storyboard, but while he draws, he says, How adorable! You can't deceive me, though. He's saying how he won't be deceived by Fuki's loveliness. He thinks, You don't listen to your parents. You must be an amazingly selfish woman. Kondo denies that idea. You're overreacting. Children usually behave like this. Boys or girls, they all act a bit selfishly. 
But Miyazaki keeps repeating, no, she can't deceive me, not a chance. And he is determined enough to reflect that image in his character. He previously drew Ponyo adorable, but he changes the girl's eyes to make them upturned. Now, Ponyo looks more greedy. Who tries to get whatever she wants? The narrator says that Ponyo has become not only cute, but also selfish. The character of Ponyo is set at this point. This character rides the huge tsunami waves, sinks the whole town under the sea just to meet a guy she loves. All these ideas flow out after Miyazaki meets Fuki. He already had the plot, but not the main character. Now he's got the perfect main character, who is arrogant, mean-looking, and gives everyone trouble to fulfill her desires. He thinks that's lovable. It's lovable, but he doesn't want to be deceived. He keeps telling himself that. You can see each stage of the, his thinking process if you watch this documentary. Now, his problem was how Ponyo comes to meet Sosuke. This is the famous scene in Ponyo, which I love, where Ponyo runs on water. I just love the way Ponyo runs. It's simply so well drawn. To be more specific, when she steps on water, she slightly sinks into the water. When people draw someone running on water, they tend to make the character step on the surface. In Spirited Away, no, it was Mononoke. In Princess Mononoke, the forest spirit walks on water. When it does that, its hooves slightly sink into the water. That tiny detail shows Miyazaki's amazing image creation ability. Same goes with Ponyo. Her feet sink a little. Meanwhile, look at the second. Oh, the last one. Look, her feet float in the air. But this is not absolutely new. While conventional, Ghibli anime is focused on realistic depictions. Miyazaki did it in earlier works like Conan or Lupin because they had comical scenes, or maybe Heidi's opening with the hopping scene, although Miyazaki didn't draw it. And I think... Running without touching the ground works as a fantasy or comedy scene with a supernatural element, but it was not something you'd see in a typical, realistically drawn Ghibli anime. That's what makes Ponyo exceptional. To make this scene, Miyazaki explains so hard to animation director Kondo that you don't really feel gravity from kids who run. That's why their feet have to pause in the air. For a split second, Ponyo has to pause during the running motion unlike other Ghibli anime drawings. So she needs to float, not like how you drew her leg up so high. Then Miyazaki suddenly stands up and starts demonstrating. He says, I think some old anime has this type of image. Then he tries to stop his legs mid-air again and again. Like the ones he saw in old comic books, which he tried to incorporate in Ponyo. And on Ponyo's character development, Miyazaki had already come up with a scene where Ponyo steals Sosuke's ham from his sandwich. She bites on it like a piranha, which portrays an egoistic but also downright greedy Ponyo. Miyazaki has this theme of portraying the progression of a woman through different characters. For example, genuine Shita from Laputa eventually turns into tough Dola. Miyazaki connects the two characters, but he doesn't depict the transition from Shita to Dola. So it's hard to imagine how Shita becomes Dola. Selfish Ponyo is in the early childhood stage of submissive Shita. Hinting that even Shita was once super selfish is the only way to connect her with Dola. Ponyo first comes out as a selfish girl. Then, when she turns into a 10 or 12 year old girl later in the movie, she becomes a very kind girl. Near the climax scene of the movie, Ponyo gives um, a baby what she likes. It proves how she has grown as a kind girl. A little girl who is originally egoistic like Ponyo grows up into a mature young lady like Shita, but reveals her true nature as she grows old like Dola. 
Then, finally, she turns into Yubaba or Zeniba. Miyazaki completes the entire life of a woman by depicting Panyo. Now, listen to what Miyazaki said about Panyo in his essay called Turning Point. Ponyo is the natural state of womanhood. She immediately acts upon her possessive instinct and rebels against everything that tries to keep her from it. Eating, embracing, and chasing, she doesn't think twice. She breeds like rabbits, she's vulgar, and she has many lovers. How she will grow as an adult woman will depend on what kind of male she meets as a little child. Animation director Kondo struggles to understand the essence of the movie. His biggest question is Fujimoto. He asks, why does Fujimoto marry Grandma Mare and doesn't divorce? Miyazaki responds that by saying, oh, that's the eternal image of a man, always being oppressed by women. Art director Yoshida is there too. Look at his disgusted face. Yoshida's facial expression changes as soon as Miyazaki says it, but Miyazaki continues. Grandma Mara has thousands of husbands. Now, we know the shocking fact of how Grandma Mara has thousands of husbands and Fujimoto is just one of them. Miyazaki adds, Fujimoto embodies the eternal suffering all men experience. But both Kondo and Yoshida are completely struck dumb by what Miyazaki says. <laughs> I think this is a great part of the documentary. To follow up, Miyazaki explains, we can't apply our own common sense. He sounds like he knows the truth. Then, that meeting is over and Miyazaki goes upstairs. <laughs> I felt so bad for Yoshida and Kondo, who looked so worried. Anyway, this is how the production of Panyo started. Hold on. I need to keep taking short breaks to go on. A comment just asked, was there only one person shooting the documentary? Yes, this guy called Arakawa from NHK. He had this one tiny handheld camera in his hand for the 300 days straight recording. The documentary is a compilation of that. There is another version on NHK channel on TV, but that one is trimmed to a total of two hours with unnecessary commentary. I don't fancy that version. But this 12-hour long version released by Ghibli is tremendously fun to watch. Now, Miyazaki concretely had the main character thanks to baby Fuki. But how about the whole image of the movie? Miyazaki always says there's a point when a piece becomes a real movie. That turning point came for Panyo on June 5th, 2006. Until then, Miyazaki had been drawing numerous images on paper with pencil and coloring them, which we call storyboards. But suddenly, he starts taking some notes and constructing the plot. He starts brainstorming how the story develops. Documentary director Arakawa comments on the narration. Miyazaki's storyboard making has been stagnating. But that evening, suddenly, I was able to witness the birth of an important picture. Okay, um, I'll use more images from now to explain it. In the picture, Miyazaki is checking both sides of the drawing paper. Like this. While he does that, he somehow starts humming. Die wa cure by Wagner. He starts humming the music, ba -ba -ba -bam, ba -ba 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 -ba. he plays the CD and sings while he flips his drawing to look at its front and back. Then he says, am I allowed to draw this? Then he starts grinning. On the other hand, he tells Arakawa coldly, why don't you go home? Which is strange, because the sun is still out and it's too early to go home. Because Miyazaki was persistent, Arakawa thought, oh, maybe he's in a bad mood, and thought about leaving. 
But his creative nature told him, if I leave now, I'm not a director. Something is happening tonight. So instead of going home, Arakawa secretly continues recording from a distance by setting the camera a little far from him. Miyazaki is looking at his own drawings and for some reason he's laughing heartily. <laughs> Then he says, she's rushing to her guy. This is an incredible drawing. And somehow he looks satisfied. Arakawa narrates, I thought Miyazaki-san would start something important, so I stayed. Then Miyazaki starts a contour drawing with his pencil. Obviously, Miyazaki is not young anymore. He used to draw with the HB pencil. But it got darker and darker from 2B to 3B, and now he uses 6B because he doesn't have much grip. Still, he keeps drawing. While he draws, he says, scary, she's coming for Sosuke, she's coming. Then, he starts coloring the pencil drawing with watercolor. Arakawa senses something different from Miyazaki, who seems exceptionally happy while he draws. But he doesn't know why Miyazaki is so happy. So he asked, how can you draw so intensively? Miyazaki simply replied, I don't know, maybe because I'm listening to Diewa Cure. But he's obviously taking a step further on that drawing, because he usually stops after coloring the contour drawing with watercolor. But this time he starts using pastel crayons that his wife used to use back in college to draw on top of the watercolor. He even rubs it with his fingers to smear it. He has never tried it before. Someone trying a new art medium after turning 70 is quite impressive. So, look, right here. You see he draws over the watercolor surface. With his crayon, then rubs with his finger to expand the stain. Miyazaki says, maybe it's the music, but I don't know why I'm drawing like this. Now, excuse me for the blurry photo. Here, what he says while drawing is scary. Maybe he's scared of his own drawing. Or his own creativity that allows him to create such a drawing. Or perhaps he's scared of Diewa Kyur. Arakawa can't figure what Miyazaki means by scary, because apparently Miyazaki seems to be enjoying drawing. Arakawa just doesn't have any clue. Meanwhile, Miyazaki keeps drawing with the crayon. He draws and smears the sky as well as the waves. It means the main character makes her first appearance under a cloudy sky. It's very unlikely for a Miyazaki anime. It's cloudy. I can manage to understand the background with the rough sea, but the black clouds? Miyazaki even smears them with crayon. It looks like an apocalyptic world. Miyazaki is making it look darker and darker. And Ponyo's mouth? Look at her droopy mouth. Is this better? Ponyo is standing straight. And if you look closely at her face, you can see the corners of her mouth turned down. This is also very unlikely for a female main character. So you see the significance. On top of that, he goes back to his 6B pencil and starts adding the contour lines. The narration says he's emphasizing simple lines. That's right. He traces the outlines of the drawing with the bold pencil lines to emphasize the picture. While he does that, yeah, you see the subtitle that indicates the melody. He continues to sing Die wa Kure. He repeats this part. Crayon smear, crayon and smear. He does it over and over to stain the drawing. And he joyfully says, I can hear Die wa Kure in this scene. If you see his face, he's smiling. And he says, scary drawing. I've titled it, Ponyo Arrives. He says, the drawing is scary. Earlier, he just said scary, but now it's clear that it was the drawing that Miyazaki finds scary or the situation of Ponyo coming that scares him. 
Ponyo is coming for Sosuke. Then, what would it be like for Sosuke who invites her? Miyazaki gives a snicker and says, Poor Sosuke. He has to confront her. Miyazaki clearly describes Sosuke as a pitiful boy. The pitiful boy has to meet a girl who loves him and comes from this apocalyptic world that commands the dark sky and waves. What a pity. Miyazaki depicts Sosuke in the same context that he depicts Fujimoto, a man who embodies the eternal sorrow of being a male. While he draws, he can't hold himself from excitement and stands up. He just can't sit still. He gets too hyped up. And he goes, scary, no, not scary, cute. So he's trying to convince himself. It's a great line. Scary. No, not scary. Cute. I was cracking up. His honest feeling is fear. But he's trying to tell himself, Ponyo has to look cute to the audience. He can't let them know how it's an essentially frightening situation. It has to look cute on the surface. That's why he's trying to convince himself. The image is now complete. Then he takes that drawing. Looking so happy. Sorry, it's blurry. He says, I'll put this up somewhere nice. So he walks around the room, then finds the most distinguishable spot on the wall, space above the light switch near the entrance. He joyfully pins the drawings there and stares at it. He titles the drawing, Ponyo Arrives. This is it. I mean, this is how the drawing turned out to be. Pitch dark sky and pitch dark rough waves that transform into fish. On top of that, you see this half girl, half fish coming for his man. It's a horror or a fantasy movie where a monster comes from the underworld in search of a beauty. That's what you see in Ponyo as well. So, he's taking the drawing of a monster arriving for the beauty and giving it a not scary but cute look. He tries to convince himself that it's possible. That's the kind of challenge Miyazaki is facing. Ponyo looks determined with her droopy mouth, the eyes looking far ahead and the fist held so tightly, she even stands on top of a fish. It, it's really not cuteness that we see, but a scene from an action or a horror movie. Until this point, Miyazaki had been drawing dozens of storyboards. For example, he drew the initial sketches of Sosuke, Ponyo posing cutely, Fujimoto's ship, etc. Oh, and the jellyfish. But every time he finished a drawing, he said, hmm, this is not what I want. So things weren't going the way he wished. He keeps on saying things like, I'm not having the grasp on it. I'm escaping from something, but I'm aware of it. Uh, I can't do this. But when he completes this drawing, he's looking straight into the camera. He goes, it's that drawing, this one. Miyazaki says, that one picture says everything about the movie. He points to the drawings behind him, then explains. I've drawn quite a lot, but none of these do the trick. Why not? These are merely phenomena. But that one over there, that's the essence. It means that these drawings in the back are there just to explain the stories and settings. They are just illustrations of events. But if he chooses one image that explains what the movie essentially is, then it's that drawing, Ponyo arrives. After he finishes that drawing, he looks so relieved. In fact, he had a cigarette in his hand, but he hasn't smoked it yet. He was that focused, but now he smokes that cigarette looking very content. He says, I've finally drawn the essence of the movie. Finally, this day, he was able to visualize what he truly wanted. Now, this is a painting of Ophelia that he saw in London. A scene of her death. She's a character from Shakespeare's play Hamlet, who is carried along by the river, dying. While she dies, though, she sings in a fading voice. Meanwhile, she's surrounded by numerous exuberant lives. 
which indicates the faint existence of life within the world of death. Miyazaki was deeply moved by this painting. And that's exactly what he wanted from the movie. Ponyo arrives is the first real image. Everything else is just an event. He had to wait until he drew Ponyo arrives to really visualize what the movie was really about. The climax scene of the first half of the documentary is where Miyazaki agonizes over his desire to produce the first true image but isn't able to or his fear toward what he is about to draw. And how he starts singing Die Wakure when he's finally making that drawing which is a contrast to his previous agony. Now he looks like a playful old man doing something naughty. Many people say they didn't enjoy Ponyo compared to other works by Miyazaki. I was one of them. And I still am. I don't think the film itself is really that interesting to watch, but the documentary is interesting. So I advise you to watch the documentary, listen to Miyazaki say scary, no not scary, cute. Then you can see things from a different perspective. It's on TV so folks record it and watch Ponyo again with the new perspectives that I taught you today. That's it for the free part. As soon as I get to the second half, I'll take a break. So the questionnaire please. The second half will be about the themes of Ponyo. I'll talk about why the ending scene of the town is reversed. I'll also talk about the commonality between Ponyo and the anime by Yoshiyuki Tomino. I'll feature his work called Aura Battler Dunbine and compare and contrast it with Ponyo. I'll also use psychoanalysis to read into Ponyo. I've never done this before to Miyazaki's anime. Well, I did something similar at a lecture in August, but I'll go in depth this time. It'll be a bit hard to follow, but hopefully you can all keep up. Now the result. Thank you, it's a good number. Next week will be this, the knowledge how to rebuild a world from scratch. And here is the manga on Jump magazine called Dr. Stone which is inspired by the book. In the latest episode of Dr. Stone, the main characters are building a drone. It's manga for science geeks. It's about whether humans can rebuild a civilization if we go back to the Stone Age. I'll talk about the book and let me show you another book. I'll also talk about this book titled Six Innovations That Made the Modern World. I'll give a lecture on these texts. I'm not going to focus too much on Dr. Stone, rather it's going to be a supplementary text for me to talk about the other two books and discuss what would happen to the world if it collapses. So next week is going to be a book reading which I haven't done in a while. And as I've already mentioned, the week after next is going to be a chit chat week. So please send any questions or words of encouragement through mails. Oh, by the way, I've added a new sticker, did you notice? Can you tell which one? This one, it says Mobile Seminar Otaking. Yes, the new sticker is a Gundam ripoff. So you'll get these stickers if I read your letter. Okay, please switch to the second part. Thank you for watching until the end. I am the most famous Otaku King in Japan, Otaku King Toshio Okada. I started planning to talk overseas about animations and movies popular in Japan in English. Before long, I'm planning to add English subtitles to movie talking in Japanese, so please look forward to it. If you ask a, com a question in this comment field of this video, maybe I will talk about comments as a theme. We welcome the people who are interested in the forefront of Japanese otaku culture and those who want to hear stories of interesting animations and movies. So please sub subscribe our channel. If there is good relation, I will get better and I will do my best. <laughs> Thanks.